Good afternoon, uh, good evening or good morning, depending on where you're joining from. Welcome uh, to this afternoon's panel discussion on post-pandemic welding. Um, my name is Will Arnold. I am the outgoing chair of the Construction Industry Council's 2050 group, um, and we're delivering today's webinar in partnership um, with the RICS World Built Environment Forum. Um, the, the CRC 2050 group, um, we represent the uh, the built environment professionals who are at the start of their career and provide a, a route for them to link up with those who are leading the industry. And in 2021, we ran a survey of young professionals to ask them what topics were most important to them uh, in the workplace and across the built environment. Um, and obviously, we had we had a few hundred responses, and so there was a number of key topics. But one of those was was around well-being in general, um, and then in particular how how things have changed since the, the COVID-19 pandemic, um, hence this evening's panel discussion. Um, this is the third debate that we've run in this manner this year. Um, previous ones were on climate in January and education in February. And if you're interested in those or future panel discussions like these, please check us out on Twitter at 2050CIC, uh, um, or you can find us on LinkedIn if you search for the CIC 2050 group. Um, that's all I'm going to say this evening. I'm leaving you in some very capable hands. We've got some truly amazing speakers joining us this afternoon. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand over to Maria, who's chairing today's session. Over to you, Maria. Thanks, Will, and hi, everybody. Um, so my name is Maria Coulter. I am founder of Construction Coach. I work with SMEs and micro businesses to help them build stronger, more profitable and happier businesses. And I'm also a non-executive director for the Construction Industry Council and former chair of their diversity and inclusion panel as well. So over the next hour, we are going to be looking at the, pan the fact that the pandemic has brought about a change in working patterns and an increased focus on well-being in a lot of industries. It's certainly something that we are talking about more and more in our industry. And the fact that recent entrants to our industry may face new challenges compared with their counterparts a few years ago, because um, it's about adapting to new ways of working, including remote working and less in-person collaboration. The world has changed a lot um, since the pandemic and the move to get online and working from home and everything like that. So in this session today, we're going to look at how well does construction compare with other industries in looking after the well-being of young professionals? And how do we teach skills and behaviours to new graduates that they may have previously learned via osmosis from five days a week in-person working? And what additional pressures has the pandemic placed on the mental health of new entrants? and how are issues such as stress, anxiety, and depression being addressed? So there's a lot for us to, to take into consideration. So I'm delighted to welcome to the panel. So we have got Laura Ayash. Uh, Laura is Managing Director of LAMC, and Laura is a management consultant. So for over 11 years with extensive experience in diversity, equity, inclusion and belonging, also cultural change and leadership development programmes. And Laura's consulting years were with PwC and Deloitte, where she focused on strategy and organisation design initially, and then branched out into leadership, change and purpose-led consulting. And she's worked in the Middle East and Europe with a range of clients across financial services, professional services, healthcare, retail, tobacco and beverages, and third sector organisations. So I think we'll get a great perspective um, and difference of, of how we compare to other organisations as well. And as a consultant, Lara focuses on building a trusted relationship with the client, creating a safe space for them to share their problems and worries without judgment, and adopting a co-creational approach so the clients feel a sense of ownership and commitment to the solution. And she also um, follows an educational approach in, in her work as well. And I'm delighted that we've also got Michelle Williams. So Michelle is a senior construction and development man manager at Igloo Regeneration. And Igloo are the UK's leading responsible real estate business and they're working with investors, communities, local authorities and landowners. 
Michelle's role is that she specialises in the delivery of housing and commercial regeneration projects. She's MRICS qualified in project management and she also has an architectural background as well. And Michelle is also the chair of Igloo's value team, whose purpose is to embed in Igloo's project values into the business through internal operations as well. And finally, in a change to our lineup, um, we were we were meant to have Haley Farrell from Arcadis, but unfortunately at the last minute Haley's unable to join us. So I'm delighted to welcome Natalie Moores, who's head of strategic marketing at Risk McKay Tribe. And they are a brand and creative um, and digital partners for new and established businesses with purpose. And they have a lot of experience in the built environment. I know that the company well, and um, coincidentally, Natalie and I met la only last Friday, but the conversation that we had in that session was very much linked um, to what we're going to be talking about today. So that's why I knew she'd be a great addition to the panel. So thanks for jumping in last minute, Natalie. Um, so we're going to hear initially from um, Michelle and from Lara. We'll hear from Laura first, then Michelle. Uh, so we'll have some opening remarks to start the process. And I'd just like to remind attendees that, you know, please put your questions in. I would imagine that a lot of you are trying to navigate through, um, you know, business operations post pandemic. There might be particular issues that are coming up with your or in, within your organizations. So please do submit your questions. Um, I'll be moderating the questions as, uh, as we progress. So I'm going to hand over to, to Laura first and then we'll hear from Michelle after that. Thank you Maria. Uh, thank you for having me and thanks everyone for joining. Um, so my journey with wellbeing consulting started before the pandemic and I have seen both the rise in burnout and wellbeing related issues and the reactive approach organizations take uh, to put a plaster on the problem uh, or let's call it a quick fix. One thing I would like to highlight uh, that cannot be underestimated is the connection between belonging and burnout. This is how the well-being conversation quickly ends up being a diversity and inclusion conversation. And this is why right now you see a lot of uh, the well-being professionals uh, sitting uh, as part of the wider DNI uh, teams in, in organizations. I'll elaborate more, more on that. So the more employees feel like they can bring their whole self to work and have a sense of belonging, the less likely they are to face burnout and mental health challenges. Um, and this is because being able to see people you can relate to, hear stories you identify with, and most importantly, having the right channels to speak up and voice their concerns or negative experiences, that all contributes to a sense of belonging. Whilst this is true for all industries, uh, if we look specifically at the construction industry, um, whether it's a diversity of talent or the cultural aspect of inclusion, it's not surprising at all that the problem um, in the construction industry is both systemic and cultural. And I think throughout the conversation today, we'll, we'll bring a bit this more to life. Um, and then when we add to this, the remote remote working aspect, where it's really hard to understand what the norms of the organizations are, what the behaviors look like. And it's really challenging to build relationships with colleagues that would you, you would normally, you know, come across in, in your normal days. But working remotely and joining in less than perfect conditions uh, make this a bit, a bit more challenging. So all, all of this, uh, interferes with the sense of belonging that people have and interferes with their ability to build a network or a support system that normally they would rely on both personally and professionally we have all had you know friends at work and, and have been able to build really trusted relationships with with colleagues so i won't go on more than that uh keen to hear from from the others but i'm looking forward to our conversation today about how to support the well-being of young professionals who are joining the workplace and you know these less than perfect conditions um also amidst other social and financial pressures that we cannot ignore in these days thank you maria michelle over to you Hi 
everyone. I'm Michelle and thanks for the intro, Maria, and thanks everyone for joining. Um, as Maria said, I work for Igloo Regeneration and those who don't know us, we are B Corp certified SME. So there's only 30 of us um, and we specialise in sustainable regeneration and development. Unlike Laura, I am not an expert in the wellness area. Um, I'm just a development project manager and so I'm coming to this discussion with the lens of a small company who are trying to figure out and how to deal with the wellness and mental health issue which has become so prominent um, and also how to best bring young professionals into the business and give them good training and experience which I think is a, a challenge um, not in just our not just our sector but uh, across other sectors as many SMEs, uh, legally don't have a de dedicated wellness role or expert within the company, but we do have something which Maria touched on called the Igloo's Value Team, um, which consists of four people and it's on top of our normal sort of day-to-day -day jobs. Um, and despite Igloo having, you know, the will and the want to make things better and improve, and I think um, we're probably one of the better companies in um, the industry, or trying to be at least, you know, we are still struggling to determine what the issues are and exactly how to address them. I mean, I think everyone could agree the pandemic intensified and compounded what was already a pretty intense and demanding industry. And I think it's fair to say that didn't necessarily have the best reputation for wellness and mental health um we i mean igloo i certainly don't have the answer um but we have are taking a positive step towards our wellness and mental health journey and that's seeking advice and help outside of the company um and so try and do that trying to help us figure things out igloo have just undertaken an independent wellness survey through the charity of mind um, so that's quite exciting um, and we will get the results back in May, um, which I think will you know, bring about quite a lot of change in Igloo as well. Um, so I'm, I'm coming to this discussion to hopefully learn as much as I can contribute. <laughs> Thanks. Amazing, thank you. Um, okay, and Natalie, is there anything that you want to add just about sort of your experiences of what you've seen um, post pandemic and thinking about sort of the well being of, of um, young professionals coming into the industry? Yeah, I think that the pandemic obviously it completely jolted a lot of things and we're still recovering now. Um, and a lot of people that, you know, a lot of young professionals that came into work throughout the pandemic were all onboarded digitally. Um, they, you know, their inception into a business was often, especially in uh, the built environment, um, it was a it was a digital onboarding. Um, so they lost out on a lot of physical contact and a lot of physical development time. Um, and as they, you know, and as we started to reintegrate into, you know, what is now, you know, seemingly a normal, more normal world, um, we almost, you know, actually recognised that we had to almost re-onboard people. Um, because actually the way of working was so dramatically different and you know we see it a lot and we you know I work a lot with a lot of clients within the built environment and it's it's the shift that hybrid working has done from working from home and flexible working is very different to hybrid working um, and it's businesses trying to understand that these are there's nuances within all of them um, and actually young people have had to adapt quite quickly but they're not used to adapting um, and that's that is a generational thing um, and us as as leaders as business owners as people within these industries are having to actually we're having to adapt the way that we work um, to understand their language because they talk a completely different language to us um, and that presents that presents its challenges and I think the pandemic is you know it, it has opened a bit of a can of worms <laughs> um, but it's one now that I think has you know we're still really new into it and I think as time goes on, um, we'll start to get a better understanding. But it's not an easy path uh, to navigate at all. Um, so we're seeing it all the time now. Um, and, and as each generation comes through, each one presents its own, own challenges. But with that becomes huge opportun opportunities as well. Um, 
but it means that businesses are having to be dynamic constantly and agile. Um, so yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how how it evolves again because I'm sure it is going to within within the next year, months, two years. You know, I'm sure I'm sure it's going to constantly keep going through iterative cycles. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for that. Thank you for that insight. Um, there's a there's a model that we that we use in the um, in the coaching world called the grow model, and it, you basically the G is thinking about well, what what is your goal, um, the R is thinking about what is the reality of the situation, and then you're looking at the options, and then you've got that commitment to do something. Um, so I think the goal has probably changed um, from from post pandemic to to pre pandemic potentially because um because Laura I know that you said in your opening remarks you were talking about um with issues with regards to um the systemic issues that we've got and the the cultural issues that we we've already that we already had in the in the industry so what is what should we be aiming for here because um you know we what what does that what is the right environment for people to be able to be themselves like what does um a great environment look like for people coming into the industry that we need to be creating within organizations yeah great question maria um and there isn't a simple answer but i will simply i will simplify it as much as possible uh, the one word that comes to my mind is barriers the more we remove barriers to people being themselves, people being able to speak up, um, bring their ideas, bring their uh, practices, agree, disagree, raise uh, challenges, innovate, think, um, this would be something, this would be key. Um, and, and this is where, again, I would highlight the systemic and the cultural barriers. By systemic, I mean, things that are in place, um, obviously not deliberately. I don't believe any company or anyone wakes up in the morning and goes like, I want to discriminate against someone or I want to create barriers to, to inclusion. But there are systemic barriers in the, the way, you know, who accesses uh, certain jobs? Uh, what does the promotion cycle look like? Uh, who gets recognized? What kind of personalities? Uh, certain people from neurodiverse conditions are at disadvantages because they cannot, they cannot uh, shine the way uh, the workplace expects them to, they shine in their own way and, and it's it's all different. Uh, those would be systemic things that are referred to and the cultural are all things about uh, people's beliefs around what is right and what is wrong and when they can challenge the status quo. Um, so that psychological safety element where people feel like they can disagree, they can share their ideas without the fear of this backfiring at them for any reason. Um, if anyone, any organization is able to at least look at the systemic barriers and do what it can to tackle the cultural aspects of it and make sure that the barriers are as low as possible and, and, and the environment is as inclusive to um, everyone's thoughts and ideas and, and the diversity of thinking uh, as possible, then I think that is our best uh, our best guess. Okay, and I mean, where can people um, where can they find support? Because I'm just thinking, you know, based on the fact that the bulk of the the construction industry in the built environment is made up of SMEs and and micro businesses. Like, where can where can people sort of go to for support to actually um, to get those foundations in place? From a starting point of view um before i even go to more smes in the diversity and inclusion space the first thing that i would do is uh listen to the people because your best way of knowing what is wrong uh, or what is right equally uh is to conduct a listening exercise and it doesn't need to be time consuming it can be a simple survey it can be utilizing your employee resource groups or ergs uh to, to create that channel of right what is sitting well with people? Is anyone, you know, uncomfortable with something? Do we have any groups that feel marginalized? Um, all of these activities can be part of a bigger listening um, exercise where organizations can start pinpointing what is really 
going on and what is wrong. And okay, for the analysis part, and then what do we do about it? This is where you can benefit from SME support. This is where there are you know a number of organizations out there, whether it's in the well-being space or in the recruitment space or in the leadership development space that can help you tackle certain problems. But if I were any organization, the first thing that I would do is try and understand the problems or the current state that I have before I jump onto who's going to come and help me fix it. Yeah, so in order for people to um, to be able to set goals within their organisation, then I guess it is looking at what the landscape is right now. Um, I remember a few years ago I wrote a course, it was for the Supply Chain Sustainability School and it was about, um, I think it was about attracting new talent into the organisation and um, it was about sort of retaining as well and and one of the things I talked about was um, looking at what the the unwritten rules are within the organization like what that kind of dictates what the culture actually is so if you think about somebody new coming into your organization like what do you say you do but what do you actually do so what do you kind of talk about well we do, we do this and we do that and these are our values but then you've got the unwritten rules of of how things Absolutely. actually work um so i think Absolutely. it's really good to reflect on yeah that. i think i mean to add to your point i think this is entirely the problem with remote working uh hybrid working is okay but uh you know during the pandemic remote working that was really one of the issues that people face and the less time you spend in the office around people, the less people in the office, the, the harder it is for you to understand these unwritten rules and to understand what the culture actually is. Because as you said, there are the values and the things that uh, companies say that they do or, or hope for, but there's actually what happens on the ground. And these two things often are very different. Yeah, absolutely. And um, Michelle, it would be really good to understand your experiences of um, sort of people coming into the organisation before the pandemic and then afterwards as well. So did you have to onboard people digitally as well sort of through the pandemic? Well, as a, a quick an anecdote, I was actually onboarded. <laughs> so my first day of working at Igloo was the first day of first lockdown. March 23rd, in case anyone's forgotten. Um, so, um, and that, I, I started working at, at Igloo after I'd taken a career break. Um, and I took that career break because I was feeling very burnt out um, because of uh, my previous role, but also some personal factors. So then coming back to work um, in the pandemic was really difficult, you know, and I, I found starting a new job, trying to learn about the role, about my project, becoming part of a new team, all from isolation, really difficult. And it, it really felt like I was taking, you know, I was further back in my career. You know, I, I already had sort of eight years under my belt and I felt like I was, it was almost coming in, it knew it was really, really difficult. And, you know, it took me a lot longer to get up to speed with things that time around than, you know, my previous role in the previous company, you know, I felt like it almost took me a year, whereas it was a lot quicker in uh, my previous company. Um, and, you know, I don't think my story is unique. Um, I think, you know, I already had work experience and I found it extremely difficult. So it must be, you know, it's really challenging for young professionals coming in. Um, and I think, you know, it's something that is still happening. Um, you know, there are still skeleton staffs in offices. Um, people don't aren't getting that face-to-face um, -face contact. And I, you know, I think certainly from a SME um, 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 perspective, and I've only ever worked for SMEs, so you know. And but the one thing I did find that was really good was that um, you get, you know. Um, exposed to a lot of different aspects of the company. You're quite often sat next to a marketing person or a finance person rather than, you know, those whole departments being on separate floors um, or different buildings. Um, so you really do learn a lot about the company um, from osmosis. And I think that something that was, you know, a real positive um, for a small company, it, it, it 
is now because you know, people are downsizing their offices, um, they're reducing um, the amount of people that are coming in, often people are hot desking, so you just don't get that contact. Um, and, you know, I think in terms of changes to people's mental health pre and post pandemic, I mean, and this is coming from my personal experience and speaking to colleagues, um, you know, things are a lot more pressurized. The expectation to always be available um, is very much there. Obviously Teams and Zoom were, you know, so important during the pandemic, but, and they increase productivity and reduce travel downtime, but, it does also mean the working day is really relentless, but then you don't get that in-person social interaction, which also makes it, you know, good, good to have like a busy day. So you've got no way of letting off steam. Um, and I think also for me coming through, um, you know, having less in-person meetings, less time on site, you know, those incidental conversations and those questions that you might ask, you know, to the side, you know, whilst you're in a, a group going around sites or whatever, you can't do those as much now and you're less likely to ask a question when you're on a, a screen and everyone's kind of watching you. So I think also with Igloo, we were already a fairly remote company before I joined, which I think is quite unusual. Um, but, and we are looking at ways of increasing work flexibility and, and that's to help our more seasoned existing employees to deal with work-life balance um, you know less time commuting all the rest of it um, but actually that's almost at odds at bringing in young people and giving them you know the in real life face time that they need so it, it, it's it's really really difficult um, and certainly something Igloo haven't figured out yet. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's something that we, you know, we're, we're part of the conversation and we know that it is something that we have to work harder on, but, you know, we're, we're also muddling our way through it. Yeah, there's, there's such a lot to navigate, isn't there? Um, absolutely. Um, and Natalie, I mean, have you have you seen the difference in sort of people's well-being and, and productivity and things like that between you know when people were there before the pandemic in the office and then now and then working remotely potentially you know what what sort of differences have you seen yeah i mean we've seen really big differences and i think you know and actually we've not only just seen differences within our culture and in our environment, but also within budgets. So, you know, training budgets have had to massively increase because the, you know, the uptake to learn is a lot slower. Um, and the, what the pandemic did is it almost forced people to have to become self-starters. You had to create this thing where you had to get up and go every day. And actually not everyone can do that. Not everyone knows how to. Um, and, what's happened is, is that culture has kind of dragged through now into post-pandemic slightly. Um, and it brings frustration. It breeds frustration in people because people are, you know, they feel more pressure to have to be able to tackle things on their own and to be able to, you know, if, if, if you know, three people can work from home and they can produce really good work, but I'm sat at my desk at home and I've not got, to, I've not got it in me. I don't know how to motivate myself it's actually bringing those feelings of depression and anxiety into people that they've never experienced before. And then as line managers, you know, we are then dealing with people that are actually navigating new feelings and new experiences emotionally that they've never had. And that challenge is also being, you know, is being tough because it infiltrates into culture, but whether it's virtual or if it's physical. Um, so it's, it's definitely, there's definitely a huge shift. And, one of the biggest things that I've noticed with the young professionals specifically is there is a lack of want to come into an office environment and office etiquette is equally not there. And, you know, it's and there's a balance, right? So there's a balance between actually we've learned so much from the pandemic and there's been so many positives that have come out from it. You know, I was only joking with one of the guys in the team yesterday saying, gosh, I've been in you know, I've been in the office sort of six days straight in the last two weeks and I've got so much washing. Like, and that sort of thing, you know, 
I love the fact that I don't have a pile of washing, but at the same time, you know, those younger individuals, I can do that. I've, be, I've been working in the environment, in both environments for a for a while so I've, I'm used to it but those younger professionals now have got so used to running their life as they want to run their life you know at home they're actually coming into an office the day feels longer than it should you know early mornings and commuting it's it, it's it's a challenge it's a real challenge and that was the norm um, and we hear excuses all the time of you know well I've got a dog now but you know but pre-pandemic if you had a dog and you were in five days a week, you were in five days a week. And us as, as a business are having to navigate those conversations. And and it's tough. It is tough. But you know, it's it's equally that younger generation we've also found on the on the flip side of it, you know, because they speak a different language, because they are so fast paced, they have brought a, a digital canniness to us so if i'm speaking specifically for rhythmic a tribe that we weren't exposed to before um and with that you know we've had huge positives that have come into the business you know we've added new streams into our services we've been able to actually you know tackle some some areas of work quicker um and that's due to them being being the way they are um but the flip side of it is again that that hybrid working challenge um, is is so for us. I, I you know I think I speak on behalf of so many businesses. Is you know is is still a challenge um, and educating young professionals around what hybrid working means, what flexible working means, and actually what it means to work in an office. Um, you know, and that you sort of in a meeting you don't just pick up the phone to to someone and say can you can you put me up a carton of milk because you're in a meeting and those are and but they don't it's you know again and it, and that's an, a more extreme example but you are educating and developing um people within the business in a different way in a different way that pre-pandemic we never had to we developed them on skills and now we're develop, de developing them sorry on so many other things social awareness spatial awareness social interaction you know there's a lot of other things that go with it and it's it's great but it's also you know it's also challenging yeah there's such a lot to, to think about and navigate if anybody's got any questions or if they want to share anything that they're doing within their organizations please put it in the chat because it would be really really sort of useful to be able to learn from each other um laura so what are you seeing with your clients you know how are how are they like navigating through this and and what does good look like potentially because there's such a lot to take into consideration um you know there is there is that kind of um you know the the fair the the bit about people want flexible work and they've experienced flexible working and they want to keep experiencing flexible working but there's also that the whole kind of the impact that that has on people's well-being and ability to be able to integrate into organizations and also to be able to for people to to be able to deliver the right performance because i mean people are there to work they've got goals they've got deadlines they're part of an organization they have to be able to contribute um so what are you saying you know can you talk about anything like good examples that you've seen like within the, the companies that you've worked with and been exposed to yeah sure maria i think natalie was um touching on a point that is very important that we are seeing a newer generation come into the workplace and i think we are living in very unique times when you have very, very different generations in the workplace um, at, at the same time. Um, the challenge that this is posing on organizations right now is the preference as to the working habits are extremely opposite. Um, so post pandemic, uh, or as soon as you know things started easing, a lot of organizations started hiring people like myself um, to tell them, okay, what, what do we do now? Do we go back to full time in the office? Do we do hybrid? Do we stay remote and save costs? What, what, what does the future hold for us? And 
again, the answer is let's conduct a listening exercise. Let's look at your um, uh, business, your practices, your departments, and, and so on. So there isn't a one size fits all here. Um, the one thing that's like became apparent really quickly is whatever organizations do, someone was unhappy with it and it was demotivating a group of people. Uh, and so if you are an organization today with us um, and you constantly hear complaints, you are not alone. Uh, there isn't anything you can do that would be 100% right. However, um, the best approach is definitely a hybrid approach, which answers to uh, both people who, you know, as Natalie said, prefer to be in the office or motivated by someone setting a what good routine looks like and getting them started on, you know, the working habits. Uh, some people are actually, you know, on a very different uh, level that they would like to be, you know, more on the creative side and an innovative side where they don't want to exist within any parameters and, and any rules. And um, it really goes back to the nature of the industry, um, the nature of the department and the nature of work in the department and a bit more understanding of the personalities within the team. This is the only way you can design something where you, if, if your intention is really to motivate people to bring their best self and to do their best at work and to perform um, and be efficient, then you really need to look at them, not an, at an organizational level, I would go down to the team level. And this is where engagement with team leads, with uh, department heads, with you know various people at different uh, levels in the organization is extremely important. So the design of the, these kind of interventions will absolutely need to include people from all levels of the organization. And I would definitely go down to interns or people who have just entered the workplace. Because again, what they need and, and how they view the workplace is entirely different to how a manager or a leader in that space um, views the, the, the workplace. Uh, so again, as, as always, it's, it's complicated. I'm not trying to be a consultant here, but there really is no one size fits all. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, what kind of questions um, do you ask? You know, when you say that you do the listening exercise, what kind of questions do you ask people? Um, it, it's as simple as um, how how's your job going for you? How are you feeling? Um, you know, questions about stress, about motivation, about support. Uh, are they getting the right support? Do they have enough interaction with their peers, with their managers? Uh, how often do they have these kind of personal check-ins? I think Michelle mentioned uh, mentioned that uh, as well, and it's an extremely important point where if you don't have that personal, you know, I mean, if you're in a physical space and you're having a meeting, um, regardless of how serious the meeting is, you will definitely have a couple of minutes where you check in with the person, you're walking in, in the office or you're, you're walking out or you're grabbing a cup of coffee. Uh, and there is that personal aspect that a lot of times in Zoom meetings is missed. Um, so it's, it's those kind of questions to, um, again, unlock the unwritten rules, unlock the, the the stuff around what is actually expected of them to perform their their jobs. And this is often what tells you whether people are feeling comfortable or or um, happy or a sense of belonging, or they actually feel like, oh, I just need to show up, do my job and leave. Um, and that itself is very dangerous from a mental health perspective. Yeah, definitely. Um, we've got a, um, a comment in from Lulana, I hope I pronounced the name right. Um, as a mother, as a professional in the construction industry and as a manager of a team of four, I personally believe that what Laura said at the beginning of the meeting is part of the solution to make the transition from working from home to office. Listen to understand, embrace everyone's culture, build trust, um, build trust based relationship to attract people to come back into the office, make them feel as they belong there. Um, yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that. I mean, what I was picking up from from what you've said, it, it is all about understanding people. But I think pre pandemic, we weren't very good at understanding people. I mean, I've been in the industry, you know, for well, since I was 16 and I worked as a consultant, you know, before I was a coach, I used to be um, a quantity surveyor and a project manager. And <clears throat> I really struggled to be myself. You know, I felt like I had to I had to um I had to up my levels of testosterone basically in the industry. That's how I felt because I was leading design teams. I felt like and you know I accept that 
a lot of that might have been some of my limiting beliefs but I felt like um I had to be you know I couldn't make any mistakes whatsoever like everything I did had to be perfect and I couldn't say anything until I like fact checked everything before I could send something out and like I say a lot of that you know was and that's what led me to coaching in the first place and to becoming a coach um was that sort of not being able to to be myself and and I just think you know construction and built environment it's just so busy you know they don't make the time to really get to know and build those relationships and you can't get away from that like if you want to build a positive culture and you want to get the best out of each other you've got to do that you've got to make the time to do that so how do we how do we start to you know to to get those messages across to the leaders you know to the to the people who are leading the team the people who are managing um you know how do we start to to get those messages across Yeah, I mean, the thing with, with well-being, and, and, and thanks for, for that, I mean, great, great point. I think pre-pandemic, I personally had one diagnosed burnout, but I think I had several burnouts in a row. Uh, the last one got me, you know, on the ground, basically, it, it killed me. But that was not, it. there wasn't enough awareness about what is happening, which is why I personally didn't know what was going on with me. I'm like, oh, I'm stressed, I'm tired, I need a holiday. Um, and then... A lot of times I would question, am I sane? Do I have something? Do I need to go and you know get diagnosis? Maybe, maybe something is broken in me. Maybe I'm not as good as those around me who can show up and do the job and be happy and, and all of this. Um, and I think this is what changed during the pandemic where conversation about mental health and the awareness started becoming more and more. And then the conversation about burnout and, and well-being and the importance of well-being uh, became you know mainstream. And this is why uh, we saw the shift in the conversation. It is absolutely not because pre-pandemic things were perfect. I think there was a lot of imperfections that just came out in the pandemic when people had to adjust last minute to so many changes at the same time uh, that everyone's resilience was really at stake. And because there was no space for people to deal with that change, it broke so many people, including myself. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, the thing is, what I personally saw during the pandemic is leaders were going through the same journey that all of us were going through, which made them a bit more uh, receptive to feedback and to sit and listen. And, and there were so many people. I mean, I remember during the pandemic, I was still with Deloitte. So many leaders in, in the business, so many senior partners put their hands up and said, I'm burnt out. I need to take time off. Um, I need to be with my family. I'm, I'm going through some, um, you know, depression. Uh, I'm on pills, like things that normally people would not really disclose and, and, and say. Um, and so I think this is becoming a bit more, um, uh, a bit more, you know, accepted as a conversation. But more importantly, what has happened during the pandemic, when the focus is on the workforce and the efficiency and companies all went to metrics to measure whether the pandemic is hurting their business or helping their business. This is where people who were burnt out or people who were demotivated or did not have a sense of belonging, their contribution to the business was low. And, and the moment there was the productivity conversation in place and there was that link between well-being and how much money a company makes, everyone, all leaders were like, oh no, hang on a second, this is really important, I need to take this seriously and there's something I need to do about it. Which is why I think we are seeing more and more commitment uh, from the board, from, this is why well-being now is a, is a board issue, it's it's on the CEO's agenda, it's, um, you, you wouldn't hear any leader in the business go on, you know, uh, any communication internally or externally without mentioning this in some way, shape or form. Well, that's good to know that they are doing that. Um... Natalie, it would be interesting to know about your experiences because you work within sort of other sectors as well, you know, looking at people's brand. I mean, brand is so important um, to organisations. Like what are you seeing any, any differences with different types of businesses that you've been working with in comparison to um, construction in the built environment as well? Yeah, I think definitely. I think different businesses are, I think, are adapting in different ways and I think I completely agree with what Lara said it's now a board issue and um, we've actually found I think in some of our more corporate clients um, 
be it you know in in lots of different industries they've actually adapted quicker than some of the SMEs and the reason that is is because they have almost it's gone it's gone to a higher level so they you know they have gone actually we need to take this seriously because this feeds into our bottom line um, so it has become a much bigger conversation um, and often they have got more money that they can throw at it to make it more of a thing whereas it's harder for SMEs because SMEs you know are diversifying their their budgets in lots of different ways and we're now making well-being you know another topic another thing and it, and it's difficult one thing that we've we've done a lot is we've done a, our our capacity to do internal communications has massively increased across the board in lots of different industries um and a lot of communicating change and whether that's you know from startups SMEs and into you know into the big corporates we've seen a huge huge trajectory path in some of our marketing being shifted from external to internal um and and I think that's a lot of it because actually you know on the higher level they're not quite sure how to communicate with employees so you know internal marketing um you know campaigns are now becoming an absolute given where before pre-pandemic you know we'd hardly touched them um because it's now been so linked with change management and progression of a business and growth and scale um the other thing that we've really seen a massive shift in you know when we build out brands and this again is is in any, in any industry and um, you know part of building a brand is you build out a value system and a lot of people when they look at a brand and they say you know and internally they look at the values and they go oh, this is a set of values but now we are really seeing businesses hang their hats on values because the employees are placing such importance on them and these values must align with theirs and actually we're now even developing behaviors that align to the values and you know and actually you know coaching coaching you know boards on how they start to develop their own behavior systems that feed out of their brand into their everyday working life so the role of brand and marketing in lots of businesses because of well-being has just completely diversified itself and you know and as i say i've never seen more importance on internal comms as as i have now it's actually got if not more importance than external comms for a lot of businesses which you know which pre-pandemic you know would never have happened um so it's it's definitely interesting and and this even stands within the built environment in fairness you know we've got a lot of built environment clients and it is it there i'd say it's maybe a, a slower adaptation um but i'm often with a lot of the clients that i work with it's it's the more they start to develop as a business empathy and they start to re they create a business empathy they start to go actually you know we need to we need to change we need to evolve we now need to look at our brand look at our values look at our behaviors look at how we communicate um and how we communicate downwards um is now becoming yeah so important um so yeah so we'll see we'll see how it can how it how it continues but yeah yes, yeah that's great. That's great to, to hear. Um, and I'll come back to a couple of points on there. But Michelle, when um, Natalie was talking, I was thinking about Igloo and, you know, what we said at the beginning about um, project values and that you're the chair of the value team. Um, and it sounds like purpose and values are really important. So, you know, you, you're, you've come into the organisation. So how are you finding that that's impacting on sort of people's um like well-being and sense of belonging and things like that uh within igloo yeah so um i mean igloo have i mean our development methodology is actually well-being it's one of the six dimensions of our development methodology that we use for regeneration and construction um and i think previously before the pandemic um that did did translate into our business operations you know we uh you know are looking to be carbon neutral um, we look to reduce all of our sort of carbon outgoings and things like that and, and that also translates into well-being and i do actually think that probably well-being has been the, the last one to be kind of focused on um and certainly the pandemic has put a spotlight on it and i think you know as lauren natalie said that you know uh, sort of senior level, we're feeling feeling the strains, feeling the stress. 
And yeah, I mean, it's something that we've been trying to put through all of our business operations and internally. I think what Laura was saying about listening um, to people within the organization is really important. And I think that's something that we have tried to do when we started on our journey with doing the, the mind survey and you know i'm sure there's lots of other sort of external assistance that other smes can um can get but you know we 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 i think we are doing we're, we're at the start of the journey but i think we're coming from a good place i mean certainly from the pandemic you know i live in london uh, central london what would they do i live in a small flat with a housemate so you know working from home continually for me it was just not feasible um you know i made my sort of want to move into an office known even though we closed a, a london office and now you know i work in a co-op working space because i like being with people i get energy from that and but then there's other people in the organization that live you know outside london and they don't want to commute so they're quite happy you know working in their um you know their home offices and i think you know there is no one size fits all um but i think um you know we are on that journey um and definitely you know get listening to what um everyone thinks and uh, getting input and you're never going to make everybody happy but um i think that's that's certainly the start yeah thanks for that um yeah because i was i was just thinking about what you just said there it got me thinking about um just about my experiences so i i started my business eight years ago so i worked from home for a long time i really wish i bought shares in zoom because i was using zoom for about two years before the pandemic <laughs> because I used to do a lot of sort of work online but um I struggled in just not having that interaction with people and that that actually made me go out and get an office so I've got an office um you know I'm, I can see people I can you know go and have a coffee I can interact with people but also um it, it also links with finding out more about myself so recently um I've become a a governor for Loughborough College and we had to do this insights profile where you you do a, a survey, you know, and sort of lets you know about your your personality, your preferences and and how that impacts from a business point of view. And what you were saying about um, needing to be around people and drawing energy from people. I think a lot of people do like some people are more kind of introvert and, you know, they're, they're more sort of comfortable being on their own and, and being in that space. But to get the best out of some people, they need to sort of draw energy from people. And I think it does come back to really getting to know sort of your people, but also understanding yourself and what you feel that you need to, to thrive um, and exceed and excel and, and do well in the workplace. Because if if you feel that you're not, you know, it, it, it just could be that the environment isn't right for you right now. So it is about sort of finding that right environment to get the best out of everybody, isn't it? Um, but another thing I was thinking about, um, Laura, was with thinking about the generational differences. What do we do about that? How do we, how do people start to understand that? Because, you know, that is something that people need to, they need to understand their team and they need to understand those differences, don't they? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's literally just being aware that um, how you have grown up and the way the world has shaped your preferences and your views is very different to someone who had way more access to technology growing up and uh, someone who interacts with social media very differently. Um, I think Natalie mentioned this uh, at some point when, when she was talking. Uh, the newer generation adapts and learns much faster and is more digitally um, savvy than than the older generations and, and that reshapes rewires the way the brain operates altogether um, so i think 
just acknowledging the fact that if you're a leader in the business and there's a 30 year difference between yourself and someone who's joining uh, the workplace today, um, it is literally, you know, the, the issues that you would have um, if, if that person has, has children, the, the children that you, the issues that you would have with your child trying to tell them what to do or not to do. It's exactly that, but in the workplace and in a professional environment. So it's definitely harder to manage. The only way is to build trust, is to do the listening, is to ensure that people have an avenue of expressing themselves, of saying what works for them and what's not. Because I mean, otherwise it's a dictatorship and it's it's literally trying to enforce some rules that are not going to be fit for purpose and are not going to serve the innovation and growth and the future of the organization. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we do have a question from John. So um, in addition to those things like burnout is mentioned, I also suspect that post mainstream pandemic, possibly till uh, not enough attention to well-being or even long COVID symptoms, many of which are subjective and possibly affected individuals. Um, yeah, I think he's trying to, I think trying to say that they, they should mention, like people should be able to, to talk about those issues and, um, you know, that would help with their mental health, being able to, to share their experiences. Yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, physical health and mental health, they go hand in hand, right? Uh, your, your mind will not be well in a body that is not well. Uh, so, and again, these things need to um, need to be addressed uh, equally and uh, there needs to be a safe space to express any, you know, long-term uh, COVID uh, conditions people are suffering from. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think one thing that, that does worry me um, is that, there, there are differences between being in a consultant and working in a, in a consultancy space and also working in, on site as well. Like they can be two very different cultures. Um, and based on my experiences and based on, on what I've seen, I think there is, there is more of an attitude on site that you you operate the way we want you to operate and I'm thinking more sometimes not necessarily with the larger contractors because I think they are you know trying to do more around sort of well-being and support but potentially with the as you go down the tiers in sort of you know working with subcontractors and you know they're kind of well this is what we're about this is what we do and take it or leave it type thing you know so how can we start to um to encourage them and get them to think about well-being and and the need for you know we want to attract trainees we want to attract apprentices coming into the industry how do we start to um to break that down more um has anybody got any thoughts on that i well i mean certainly igloo um often put within our employees requirements when they're going out to tender to get a, a contract that you know they have to adhere to certain social value aspects, um, TOMS is a way of measuring social value, which includes bringing on apprentices um, and, um, you know, effectively um, setting a guideline for how we would like them to operate. Um, I think it needs improvement. Um, and of course, you know, that may, will, as you said, go to the main contractor and then that needs to be filtered down to the subcontractors. But I think it's the same problem that consultancies have that, you know, it's the bigger organisations that have more money to throw at it. So, you know, they have, you know, resource and more awareness and, you know, independent, you know, a specialist personnel within the organisation to deal with it. Whereas again, subcontracts are smaller outfits. You know don't have that um but you know hopefully the main contractors then felt filter that down to the subcontractors um you know and there is improvement there but you know it's definitely imperfect and I, that's um you know probably you know it's there's definitely room for improvement yeah i think okay so um we've got we've literally got a minute left um and it's gone really quickly, the, the conversation. Uh, I think just to sort of sum up what we've been talking about, I've made a few notes. Um, I think, the, the, you know, the key things that have come out is, 
it is about it's about listening it's about sort of getting to know your people um what they need um how they can be themselves like being able to create that environment where they can be themselves in the workplace um understanding what they need but also understanding what you need from them and i think that's where the internal marketing comes in you know the, if people are really clear on what their goal is what their vision is what their purpose is the part that people need to play in that and they want them to play in that organization i think is so important um and also thinking about how can you create that environment for them to succeed it's not going to be perfect as we've heard you know so not everybody's going to be happy but you know there is that 80 20 rule isn't there like if if, if the majority of the people are happy then you know that that's got to be a good thing it's about building trust and it's about creating avenues to to express themselves as well and i think you know what we've just been talking about about the role that larger organizations have to play with their supply network um, and sort of saying this is what we expect from you and we need you to pass those communications down and you know we want we we want um you to to tell us what you're doing and you know put put forward some some ideas and and put the right policies in place within their organizations as well um so yeah i mean i think there's some there's some great um points that have come across in the discussion hopefully people will will take away um some real sort of actions that they can take as well you know it's 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 about it's not just it's the right thing to do but clearly it's the right thing for business as well from a from a business case scenario like you know it's going to make a difference on on so many different levels so um i think we're at time on we've gone a minute over so have we got any um is there a, i think there's some final slides that need to be shared um so we've got future webinars coming up there's affordable housing challenges and challenges and solutions a new cycle for CRE and generative design a knowledge-based approach to construction so you can find out um there's a link there where you can find out more about um previous webinars as well so we've got future ones and previous so i'd just like to say thank you so much um if you want to visit the world built environment forum as well there's a link there at raracs.org forward slash wbef so thank you to everybody who's been listening today thank you so much to our panelists thank to michelle to laura and to natalie as well and um hope to see you on another one in the future thank you